You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. Mary Lou McCulley. I think of your husband, Ed, Ed McCulley. He was what we called a BMOC when I was a student at Wheaton College back in the 40s. He was a big man on campus. Or he was a BTO, a big-time operator. I was just a TWO, teeny-weeny operator. And I, I know that all the girls were just swooning over Ed. He was what we used to call a dreamboat in those days. I think they would have called him a hunk more recently, and there's probably something much more recent than that. I'm very outdated on vocabulary. But Ed was tall, handsome, a football player, a track star. He was a musician. He was the president of his class. He won the championship in the Hearst Oratorical Contest in which there were 20,000 entrants, I understand, and Ed McCulley took first place. I mean, he was something. And as I recall, he, he really wanted to be a politician. He was going to go into law school. And we didn't have any trouble imagining Ed McCulley as president of the United States someday. Well, I've given you my impressions of Ed McCulley. You tell me what yours were, Mary Lou, when you first met him. Well, those were my impressions, and he actually swept me off my feet. But uh, along with all that, he also he was very real, he, and he loved people. He loved life, and even though he wasn't one that you would look at and think he's going to be a missionary, or he has this tremendous dedication or commitment, he did have it. Sort of kept it hidden, didn't he, in, in well, some ways? It's, it was something that grew with him. I think at Wheaton, he did not have the dedication to the mission field. He was a Christian, and but it was through the years, well, it weren't, it weren't a lot of years, but it was something that grew with him. Yes, it was. I would agree. He was he was very real, and he wasn't going to put on any kind of a front. And I have to confess that I was one of many who thought that Ed McCulley was not very spiritual because we had a hard time putting together spirituality with the tremendous gifts and popularity that Ed had, and realized later how wrong we were. And I often look back on my college years, and when I hear the stories of what's happened to certain people, there so many are. So much better than you thought they would be, and others turn out to be sort of failures that you wouldn't have expected. But Ed had us fooled, and when he went to Ecuador, people were just amazed. Here was this man with all this talent. Now, why would he want to, quote, throw away, unquote, all those talents in an unknown corner of the jungle? Obviously, it was the Lord working with him. A good deal of it was the influence of your husband, Jim Elliott, when they were at Wheaton, and I'm sure Jim's prayers, his folks had given him to the Lord after his death. His mother wrote a poem, a gift is a gift is a gift. She'd given him to the Lord, although she was surprised that he became a missionary also. Uh, it was basically through the reading of Nehemiah that he made the final decision to go to the mission field. Do you know how or what, what it was in that book? Just the fact that Nehemiah was called to restore the people, restore the wall, and bring back God's people. And he was obedient. Right, mm -hmm. and he was obedient. And uh, he felt like he needed to wholeheartedly serve the Lord. And uh, he had said in a letter to Jim that he felt like he w it would be a thrill to preach the name of Jesus Christ to a pe people that had never heard it. And then a lot of people don't know that Ed and Jim went to a small town in southern Illinois, and that was when I first met Ed. He and Jim had been there, and they had a radio program. They worked with kids, poor kids, lived along the river, had a club with them. They did some young life type work. Yes, that was preparation for foreign mm -hmm. missionary work, wasn't it? Now, Ed had actually begun law school, hadn't he, when he graduated from Wheaton? Yes, he had finished the first year of law school, and it was during the summer he'd taken a job as a night clerk in a hotel, specifically so he could study the Bible. And it was during that time that he was reading Nehemiah, decided he needed to go to the mission field, made a special trip to visit each one of his professors to tell them, and they too were shocked that he was going to throw away his talent. Not all of them. Some of them commended him. And that was, uh, that's when I met Ed, was at that time. And I remember you and Ed lived in the same house where I had lived when I was learning Spanish, the Adiases, mm -hmm. in Quito, by the immersion method. We learned Spanish. They didn't speak any English. They couldn't so. speak a word of English, so you either sink or swim there. And 
I know that you both swam. No. <laughs> yes. It swam and I waited. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you went to where? Then we went to Shandia, the mission station at Shandia, where Jim and Pete, who were still single missionaries, were. Our plan was to settle there and then the men be available to t- make trips. And uh, although we had a few roadblocks, the, the station, as you remember, was, uh, there was a flood and the station was a good deal of it washed away. With yeah, the they flood. had already laid the foundation for, for your our house, house right. and then and it, it was all away. went down the river and eventually down the Amazon. But we we went to Shandia. We felt like that was still where we were to go and just build ourselves. The Indians built us a bamboo house, and we lived there for two years. Part of the time, Jim and Pete were there, and then Jim left, of course, and you and Jim were married, and you started another station, and Pete was there. I was there when Pete was quite ill with malaria. Then when Pete left to marry Olive, and then when you folks, you and Jim, came back to Shandia, uh, the way opened up to go to another, to open up a new mission station at Arahuno, which happened to be one of the closest, sta- the closest station to where the Alcas lived. We started by going over on weekends. That's when I got acquainted with Nate because I got very air sick and he became my friend. <laughs> I became his friend. Mm-hmm. And uh, then we moved over there while you and Jim stayed at Shandia. Yes, Nate Saint was the pilot of Missionary mm-hmm. Aviation Fellowship that served all of our jungle stations. And it, am I correct that Ed was the one that was with Nate when he discovered... The as, as I remember, he was. So. I'm pretty sure that's true. They mm-hmm. were flying over the jungle, and they had a little bit of extra time. And mm-hmm. Nate had many times tried to find mm-hmm. some inhabited Alka houses. I think he'd many times seen abandoned ones. But on this occasion, to their enormous excitement, they actually found mm-hmm. a house where there was smoke coming through the roof, and there were some naked people out there. There was no question about it that these were Alkas because the other Indians in the jungle wore clothes. And so Ed became one of the participants in Operation Alka, and he and Jim Elliott, my husband, would take turns flying with Nate each week. Nate would do the flying, and either Ed or Jim would drop the gifts. And I think you had something to do with some of the gifts that were dropped, didn't you, Mary Lou? Well, we put together pots with trinkets in them, and we tied machetes onto uh, the string that was dropped from the plane whatever we thought the Alcas would be interested in. Yes, Nate had invented an incredible method of lowering a bucket to the ground as the plane circled, and I'm told that aeronautical engineers had studied his plans for the thing and said that it would never work, but it did work. It took an extremely skillful pilot to do that. Now, during this Operation Alka, as it was called, over the period that these gifts were being dropped, Mary Lou, wasn't there an alert in your station out of Huno and the Indians, the Kichwas came and told you that an Alka had been there? Yes, there was. Uh, in fact, it was at a time when Ed was at Puyupungo, I believe, and uh, the Kichwas said that they somebody had seen an Alka right at the end of our path. So, there you were, supposedly, all by yourself in the jungle with... How many children Two at that children. point? Two little Steve children. Two little children. Ages. Uh, three and one. Mm-hmm. And I imagine. I, we let Ed know, and had Ed and Nate came back immediately. Nate picked yes. up Ed, and he came back. And they walked up and down the airstrip, calling out the few phrases that they knew, just in case the Alcas were still hiding. Not really fearing them, thinking that this would be somebody that maybe had run away, as we had heard of others that had run away from the tribe. Yes. And so finally, it was in January of 1956 that the men felt that the time had come to meet these Alcas, these Indians, face-to-face on the ground after dropping all these gifts. And it was in your house at Arahuno that they met for the last time to pray and go over their plans, right? Mm -hmm. Do you remember that prayer meeting? No, I remember singing the hymn that has become well-known, We Rest on Thee. I remember Jim and Ed getting on a scale because they both wanted to be the first one to go in, and Ed telling them 15 pounds would make a difference, and Ed, who wasn't quite 15 pounds more than Jim, so Ed won the toss. <laughs> I remember the excitement, and yet we'd had lots of planning meetings where things were very serious, but this was expecting a great thing. Well... You know, most of our listeners know the rest of the story, that all five of these men were killed 
by the Indians to whom they had gone to take the gospel. Mary Lou, just very briefly in this last less than a minute that we have, can you tell us, bring us up to date a little bit? Where have you been? I did return to Ecuador for six years, had a home for missionary children, which was great while my children were young. And then I felt the Lord leading me back to the States. And your baby was born. My son Matthew was born uh, a month after the men were killed, and he's he wants me to say he's been a great joy, <laughs> so here's my chance. <laughs> I heard him he say has. That. He's been very much like his father, and his, he and his wife and two children live just five miles from me, so I babysit his children quite a bit. And you have how many grandchildren? Four. Just four. Thank you so much. My guest today was Mary Lou McCulley, widow of Ed McCulley, who was killed in Ecuador in 1956. Thank you so much, Mary Lou.